afternoon, everyone. Um, can I just ask that for the um, duration of the call that everyone keeps their cameras and their microphones turned off? Uh, we will be taking any and all questions in the chat throughout, um, but just as this is being recorded, it will um, make for a nicer experience overall. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to go through a quick intro uh, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, this is the second of our Pride Talks series hosted by BCS Pride. Uh, today we're speaking with Dr. Alfredo Carpinetti. Um, he has very kindly agreed to join us and I am very excited to hear about his journey um, within sort of the tech sphere. Before we get started, I'm just going to give a bit of an introduction to BCS for people that maybe haven't heard of BCS before. Uh, so BCS are a member-led organisation. Uh, we actually have 60,000 members across 150 organisations, uh, 150 countries, my apologies. Um, BCS's entire goal is to lead the IT industry through its ethical challenges. So make tech uh, good. That is, that is the entire hope for BCS. And the way that BCS is hoping to deliver on that is with its member groups. Um, so within BCS, uh, we have multiple member groups and BCS Pride is one of those member groups. We're a brand new committee that was uh, formed earlier this year. Our goal uh, includes increasing the visibility of LGBTQIA plus BCS members, as well as within the wider community uh, outside. We want to make tech an inclusive and a welcoming place to be and to highlight and change things that are not right um, in the industry as it is. And the way that we do that is with fantastic people joining us and pushing us forward into the future. So we're hoping that you might do that. Um, now, today we are speaking with uh, Dr. Alfredo Carbonetti. He is an Italian astrophysicist, science journalist and social activist. He is also the chair and founder for Pride in STEM, which is an award nominated British charitable trust dedicated to supporting and showcasing LGBT people in science, technology, engineering, and maths. And he is also recognized as one of the 100 LGBTQ trailblazers by Attitude magazine. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Carbonetti. Carbonetti. Hello, thank you, Mary, for the introduction. I need to say, since I sent that to you, uh, Friends STEM actually became a charity. So, progress. Uh, wonderful. So, uh, I am going to uh, start talking to you about my experience in uh, from a PhD uh, through my current work and uh, why um, Friends STEM exists. And I have uh, called this talk uh, Space, uh, the Final Front Queer, which you should all be able to, uh, to see now. Uh, so, who am I? Which, uh, given there is a talk about identity, I think it's important that we start with that. So, uh, I'm Alfredo, and my pronouns are he, him, uh, and China founded Prime STEM, as a physicist, science communicator and journalist, but important for this talk is the following. I am a raging homosexual, but why am I raging? We'll find out later, and is because I am angry a lot about the state of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths. Um, it is 
I am an optimist. I am a person that believes that we can use science to make the world better. And the fact that uh, um, science is so full of bias is something that uh, really, really grind my gears uh, and bothers me to the core. But before we get there, there is a little bit else to discuss. First, I'm gonna tell, um, tell you a little bit about my PhD, so the science part of this talk. And then we'll tell you about my work um, in science communication. And then we will discuss uh, what it's like being LGBTQ plus in STEM. And then we'll summarize uh, uh, that uh, a little bit. So let's start with the science. And something that I was asked by BCS is talk about a fail tale, which for me came quite early because my first project of um, in my PhD didn't go well at all. So I was tasked to um, have uh, um, this project on um, gravitational lenses. So, so as you can see here, there is those two bright dots uh, are two big galaxies. And uh, what looks like a nice little face, a smiley face around are actually three images of the same, gal uh, same galaxies being warped by the massive gravity of those this too big object. So my uh, approach was to create a software that could turn um, those kind of uh, uh, images into maps of uh, the, ma the mass around those galaxies. But it was definitely not a good fit for me. It was too complicated uh, computationally and it really wasn't me. And I have spent a year on that uh, with uh, not much to show, in fact, sad face. And uh, despite it didn't go well, I think it was uh, um, probably, um, I don't know, maybe I'm romanticizing it now, but it was necessary for me to get to something that I really enjoyed. And what it was was study galaxy evolution. So let's talk about galaxies. This is going to be important to explain why what I did. Galaxies are in have all shape and sizes, but most importantly, they transform to one uh, type to another. Uh, we have some galaxies that are uh, spirals. Uh, these two um, are also spirals, but we see them uh, side on. There are elliptical galaxies, which are just big ball of stars, irregular, which are just messy. And Edwin Hubble in almost 100 years ago um, had this nice classification and he believed that uh, they were uh, on a nice evolutionary pattern. You start with elliptical uh, because he saw them further away in the universe and they were quite bright. And then eventually you get spiral arms and turn into something that looks a little bit like the Milky Way. And so we have this late type galaxy. This is why they're called late type because um, we're supposed to appear later a spiral or a spiral or irregular. Alternatively, you have the early type galaxies, uh, uh, which can be lenticular or elliptical. The problem is uh, that Edwin Hubble was completely wrong. It's actually the other way around. You form first spirals and then the galaxy collide with each other and form elliptical galaxies. And that was my work, uh, building up a merge uh, timeline of the merging process and understanding what's going on, uh, in particular when um, stars, uh, uh, Star formation is induced, so merger creates a lot of mess and creates a lot of new stars, but also feeds material to the supermassive black holes we believe is at the center of almost every galaxy. And that's uh, pretty much created this uh, thing called an active galactic nuclei. And more uh, importantly, something about the early type galaxy is that for many, many decades, they were considered red and dead. So something that not much is going on, but work um, done by me and by many others over the last few decades have shown that actually these early type galaxies are a lot more active um, than we uh, previously thought. And there is new star forming, not as many as the spiral galaxy like our um, own, but there's still activity going on. 
And this was pretty much the results of uh, my, my PhD. And despite spending a year on something that it wasn't me and it didn't really work, I was lucky enough to then find something that uh, allowed me to uh, be happy doing research because PhDs are really tough. They are extremely taxing psychologically and we can talk a lot. You can ask questions about, I think this should be changed to improve uh, the experience of students. Uh, but until those changes come, we need to make sure that us ourselves, if we are getting into um, graduate research or any other type that we understand what we are getting in and what are the requirements. Doing something that you like, even though it might have a lot of things that you don't, but doing something that mostly you like uh, really has a huge impact. And I am very fortunate uh, because uh, after I left my PhD, I got to do something that I love and something I love the most is talking about science. And I do that in two ways. As a science communicator, um, I have a blog and a podcast called The Astroholic, in which I talk about science, do videos about science, do, uh, as I said, podcasts about uh, science. And sometimes I make cocktails and talk about science. Um, and it is extremely good fun. And also it's not that I get much money from it, so, and it's something that it's for me, for my benefit. I just something, it's my hobby. I really enjoy doing that. And the other thing that I do is uh, my uh, journalism. I am the senior science writer for IFL Science, and I mostly cover space, but I also cover a lot of other things and even ridiculous stories, uh, but them to be popular. And I feel um, it is uh, an, or an enormous privilege uh, having such a big audience and having uh, so many people read my article. And I feel that that is very important for me to uh, make sure that our editorial content uh, represents the diversity that uh, we truly see in the world uh, and not uh, uh, the biased diversity that we see in, um, in STEM, unfortunately. And um, that's uh, as the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of people is on board with that. So we get great feedback. But uh, uh, once in a while we get hate mail and I had one that was uh, absolutely fascinating, I would say this week. Uh, I covered this study about how about one in 500 cis men uh, have an extra um, sex chromosome. So sex chromosomes uh, mostly are, uh, for most people, are either XX uh, or XY. Uh, and for, but there are exceptions. There are like a triple X or XXY or XYY. Uh, -Y. And those are just five very simple determination that uh, showed that uh, uh, genetically sex is not a binary because you already have five uh, different uh, uh, way for the sex uh, chromosome to appear. And somebody uh, wrote to me and complained that uh, the this five actually represented the binary, which I was very tempted to just reply and like, okay, let's count together. XX, XY, XXX, XYX. X, Y, Y. But I didn't do that. But it was also hilarious because uh, um, they included uh, the full name, uh, address, and everything. And I was curious. And I went on Google. And it turned out that they were taken to court uh, by environmental groups in the 90s because they shared state secrets. And I'm just like, wow, I wouldn't email anyone with my... <laughs> With my information, if, uh, to be honest, I wouldn't send anyone a hate uh, mail, but oh, who knows? But uh, it, it goes to show that despite uh, um, how varied and diverse is the world, there are still people that cling to the idea that uh, science should be catering only to uh, the privileged few. And this is why it is uh, um, important to me to spend uh, 
uh, so much of my free time uh, working as an activist for uh, pregnant STEM. And uh, I always say that uh, some science happens in a physical vacuum, but no science happens in a historical one. And is the fact that we, we're so, it's so tempting and I fell into this trap so many times and I'm sure that will continue to fall into this trap to think of science as something that is pure and beyond the grubby little fingers of humans. We want to put on science, given that science is so crucial to our modern world that we want to give it a almost magical sense of being beyond the human world is something that is uh, there to guide us, a uh, shining light. Uh, but uh, we need to always remember that it is done by humans for humans. Uh, and uh, even there is some sort of uh, real platonic truth uh, beyond everything, uh, reaching it, it still goes through the messy world of humanity. We can look at diversity in science in general. Uh, this is uh, both based in the UK, uh, and it is really not good. Uh, from uh, the Royal Society um, survey uh, from 2014, we see that uh, women are uh, the are underrepresented. Um, black and ethnic minorities that should be a much higher of percentage of the population. Uh, are underrepresented. Uh, people um, that have a disability are underrepresented. Uh, the Royal Society didn't bother to ask anything about uh, uh, gender minority or uh, sexuality in uh, that. So, um, the Institute of Physics did uh, found very similar uh, finding, although uh, in uh, physics the number of women is even lower, at least it was in 2015. Something that was quite interesting, uh, the students uh, there were black and ethnic minority were actually consistent with the uh, general population, which was very awful to see. But then something that happens between the universities and early career cut that in half and showed that there is a massive problem in retaining uh, people into SAM. And uh, also, the, um, it appears that the, there is a good representation of LGBT, at least at the time it was LGB, I don't think they asked about a trans issue back then, uh, in uh, physics, but uh, given that the complication of collecting uh, queer data, uh, it's always uh, wondering how was this collected and for what scope. So we get to the part on why I am angry. This should have already be um, a good wake up call of there are major problem about diversity in science, but specifically for uh, queer people, LGBTQIA plus uh, people in STEM, I always say that if you are enraging, you are not be paying attention because data showed that the vast, there is a, a binary, almost binary distribution of people that can be out and are out, and people that cannot be out and are not out uh, in, in academic setting, even though a lot of people are out uh, um, to their friends and family. Um, there is a huge amount of harassment in STEM. Most of them, the brunt of that is uh, taken by non-binary and trans people. There is a general there is a general ignorance of what are the issues that matter to the community. There is, oh God, this is the point that really drives me wild. Um, so there is a pressure for LGBT employees to stay closeted. One third people in physics back in 2015, uh, when they answered this survey, felt that they couldn't be out of work. But 42% were pretty much told that they are expected to not act too gay. So this is in a physics, physics department around the US, which made me consider clearly as a physicist 
there must be a scale of gayness and there must be a level of acceptable gayness for a physicist. So I present to you um, this scale that goes from zero to Elton John, which is a 1.6 Kenneth Williams, if you prefer imperial uh, measurement. And there must be a level in which for physicists is too much. Obviously, this is ridiculous because uh, saying that there is an acceptable level of gayness means that the level is zero. There is, there shouldn't be anything about your identity that stops you from being a good, successful physicist because it's not about who you are. It's about what you do, something that we have repeated a lot uh, by people that really hate what, what we are. When it comes, as I mentioned, uh, trans and non-binary people take the brunt of all the hate and harassment. Uh, um, many, over 20%, don't have a bathroom they feel comfortable and safe using. And it's not like they're in the lab for 10 minutes uh, a day, they're in the labs for eight to 12 hours. That is awful. Uh, coworkers don't use preferred pronouns, uh, actually don't use the correct pronouns, which is absolutely ridiculous. Again, it's you're just being a horrible person. Uh, I don't know if I can swear, but you're just being a horrible person. Insert whichever favorite swear word you have uh, if you don't use the right pronouns for a person because you wouldn't call them the wrong name. Uh, so why not use the right pronouns? Uh, this one, when I started using this uh, stuff, uh, um, I used to point out that, uh, oh, it's very US that health benefits don't cover translated needs. But in the UK, in the last few years, uh, trans healthcare has gone down the drain and it is absolutely awful. And if uh, university institutions are not uh, uh, doing more supporting uh, trans and non-binary people, then it's everything they're saying, all the nice rainbow flag that they put on their logo amount to nothing. This also affects the next uh, generation because uh, it leads to less uh, sexual minority. This was a study on uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual and pansexual students uh, feel less represented. And even though they studied for four years to be in STEM, they decided not to continue STEM after their undergrad. The situation in the UK is just as uh, terrible uh, with a lot of LGBT plus respondents considered leaving uh, because of discrimination and harassment and one fifth of trans respondents considered leaving often. And from this, you can see that uh, there is harassment across the board if you're a man, non-binary, a woman, trans, cis, asexual, gay, heterosexual, lesbian, bi and pansexual or any other sexuality, all experience harassment. All of those orange bars should not be there at all because institutions should not allow harassment of any kind to exist. And this was from 2019, it was not from 30 years ago. And is uh, um, the same with uh, uh, the perception of the climate in the working uh, environment. The, the nobody should feel very uncomfortable in the working environment is absolutely absurd that uh, we're still having this conversation that harassment has not been stamped out it is there is something rotten to the core in um, higher education and professional organization that uh, refuse to actually take the proper action that they should in general um there is major system inequality for LGBTQ professional. They experience more career limitation, harassment, and professional devaluation. And this is even more true for LGBTQ identifying women, racial, uh, racial and ethnic minorities, and uh, trans and non-binary people in STEM. So what can we do to change things? Because yes, there is a lot that it is upsetting, but that is mostly to not sugarcoating the reality that is STEM. We need to work for an inclusive and intersectional revolution. We are not just talking about the inclusion, which is uh, making you come into the door. Uh, what is the phrase? Uh, um, inclusion is being invited to the ball. Belonging is uh, be asked to dance. Uh, 
to get to the belonging, you need to have organization that act to make sure that you are valued, you are listened, and you are never, ever harassed. And for as much as we need to change organization, we need to start from ourselves. We need to challenge our own biases and understand precisely our privilege. Biases because we're all born in society that are rife with biases, misogyny, homophobia, homophobia, transphobia, um, racism, ableism. We are born into that. We are educated in that system. It is something that we need to work on ourselves. We need to understand our privileges because many of us are privileged and we can use that to bring the change that we can see is necessary. We need to commit to make the world of science a better place. The bitter appeal is that we want revolution, at least I want revolution, uh, but we struggle to achieve incremental positive changes. So it is crucial that we think about actionable items actual steps that we can bring forth uh, and that we can ask uh, to be brought forth by the people that have power. I know that many of you probably are not senior enough to make those uh, changes a reality, but uh, maybe you have other ways to push for that change. Uh, and it is important uh, uh, not to feel demoralized uh, about uh, the size of the task ahead of us but uh, we can all make it uh, make the world a little bit better and that is already a massive step forward so at an individual level we can have stuff like pronouns and email signature badges on zoom etc be an ally proactively across the board any kind of discrimination know about what uh, is necessary to know if you're a senior share statements support participate in mentorship awareness training Remain informed, educated about anything. Don't be a bystander. Get involved. And don't let people's rights become a matter of debate. If you have any institutional power, general toilets, uh, mark important days, uh, have good work policies uh, to safeguard LGBTQ here and abroad, talk to your community on what to do. And if you um, don't have institutional power, Try to organize as a community and try to push for that change. And the way that I try to help is through Pride STEM. Uh, oh, I do see. I, uh, I need to update this one as well. We are a charity, no longer a charitable trust. What the way we help is through OutThinkers, which are informal science and technical talks, uh, LGBTQ STEM, which help. Uh, um, taking down a little bit of the stigma of who can be in STEM and uh, what makes a scientist uh, and show that uh, there's so many ways to be uh, in STEM or any, uh, or any technical fields. Uh, uh, there is not one way to be a scientist and not uh, one way to be in tech. There was no one way to be an engineer or a mathematician. Uh, we have a huge social media presence, which again, privilege, and so we um, share resources uh, and uh, put our weight uh, uh, behind causes that uh, uh, we believe are right. We promote resources and we support other events aim at LGBTQ people in STEM. And um, we have, uh, over the last few years, contributed to this all-party parliamentary group with the British Science Association. It's uh, I would say at times not easy dealing with uh, uh, the politics aspect, uh, but uh, um, yeah, we find it's necessary to at least put forward evidence that we think are um, necessary for people to hear and know. And we want to continue to demonstrate uh, that uh, there is a need for change in STEM. Uh, and not the, uh, we are not the only organization in STEM. There are so many others, uh, and together with uh, most of them, um, we have launched what I am the most proud of, uh, the LGBTQ plus STEM Day, which is the International um, Day of LGBTQ People in Science, Technology, Engineering, and Maths. Geez, I really need to update this. November 18, 2022. And it's online and everywhere. And I feel that it is so important is 
it's just a small step in the many initiatives uh, to support uh, uh, people around the world uh, in terms of diversity in STEM, but uh, I feel that's something that we can make, uh, uh, we can spend a day to highlight, and there are a lot of um, big names that help us share that. So, um, these are all the other organizers, uh, which are all absolutely brilliant. And uh, these are some of our supporters. Uh, you can see CERN there, the European Space Agency, lot of other people. And I have a few uh, tweets that uh, from last year that I wanted to highlight. We had an astronaut. We had uh, LGBTQ Seven Day was celebrated on every continent. So that's, uh, that was exciting. And uh, we had some uh, people like the Natural History Museum that uh, help us share the good word. And yes, there are there is a lot that we need to do, um, but I hope that I showed that we can uh, make it happen even a little by little by little. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alfredo. That was that was fabulous. Um, before I get started with my own questions, I just want to remind everyone that if anyone does have any questions now, uh, this is the Q and A part of the section. So you can either ask your questions in the chat, or you can um, pop your hand up as well, uh, and we can get you on mic to answer any questions that you might have. Um, I guess my my first question that I've got and and it was kind of burning at me from from the start of your presentation actually was what actually got you excited about astrophysics <laughs> I struggle with that word sorry astrophysics uh, so yes. um actually what got me excited were dinosaurs so ah. this will date me a lot uh, because uh, when I was little um we didn't know how dinosaurs uh, died so the three main hypotheses were uh, massive climate change uh, probably caused by volcanoes, uh, the Deccan traps, uh, I think uh, had already been found evidence that were erupting at the time. Um, there were some supporting evidence suggesting that there was an increase in uh, the amount of iridium. Uh, which is this metal um, found in uh, asteroids. Um, so maybe she suspected it maybe could be an uh, asteroid. But another suggestion was a supernova. Um, I was so obsessed with dinosaurs. I wanted to, be, to become a paleontologist. And when I came to London the first time, um, I begged and begged and begged my parents to take me to the Natural History Museum. And I loved it. And before I got there, I already had a book about what was going to be in the Natural History Museum. So I could tell my parents all the amazing dinosaurs that were there. And among stuff there, there was this description of how did the dinosaurs died? And um, there was this word that I was not familiar uh, with, supernova. So went back uh, home and I took the encyclopedia still on paper back then and it looks at the word supernova in the description which was quite comprehensive but i really didn't really get it when i was nine uh, in the early 90s uh, so i asked for an illustrated um, space encyclopedia and that was the the beginning of the end <laughs> at that point uh, it was just like uh, uh, i got uh, obsessed with space uh, i was then and i knew i wanted to be in space for the rest of my life and uh, i am so fortunate that i had that wish granted <laughs> that is that's amazing as someone who was also a dino mad, uh, mad kid um that is as good a reason as any to get into astrophysics i i really do love that um so my next question was uh Funnily enough, when you were going through the stats about how people feel comfortable at work, um, when it came to pronouns, what I found really interesting for me is I thought the rates of um, people using pronouns wrong was actually lower than what I expected it to be. Um, but I don't know whether that's my personal experience. Um, so um, I did see that there were a couple of actions at the end of your, your slide. Um, but is there any sort of 
anything that you can any one action you'd want people to take to move forward um and that would kind of be uh, organizationally and at an individual level i feel at an individual level anything you can do to support uh, um, trans and non-binary people at this point uh, it is uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Uh, the media and uh, our current government uh, are being absolutely abysmal. They're using trans and non-binary people as a wedge issue on a culture uh, culture war. But uh, um, the survey that came out today showed that uh, the vast majority, I think over 75% of uh, uh, people are completely fine with trans and non-binary people. So it is an absolutely no, uh, no, it's a no issue. There is no problem in um, the UK, uh, but it is made an issue. And uh, as we were already saying in the US, uh, um, not even a year of culture war about trans people has turn, uh, turned into a, an attack on us all, and even more because it spread from uh, uh, trans staff to general LGBTQ staff to Women and ethnic minorities. So it's just like, oh, everyone knew the white cis that patriarchy hates, so now it's targeted. So it's just like, ah. Oh. Uh, so I think anything you can do that can be as little are just uh, reading a few books uh, um, that are about that. I can rec uh, recommend uh, The Transgender Issue. Uh, it is great. Uh, um, great volume on that. Uh, just being informed and be ready to step in, it's already good enough. Or be ready to uh, correct people if they're getting something wrong. Um, so that could be at an organizational level. I always say is that the most important thing is, yeah, the first step is always listen to um, your community and ask them what they need because there are certain need that um, it's not a, a one size fit all. So first step is what they need and make it happen. Is if you ask what do they need and they give you an itemized list, pick one. Even if you start with the easiest one, start. Like uh, the first step is always the is always the hardest on a, the long road to change. Yes. Yes, you're you're hundred percent right with that. And we actually recently made a change within BCS, um, uh, triggered by one of our BCS members actually to change um, how gender was recognised at the point of signing up uh, within BCS. So that's one example of how like even just a small change can make a big difference, because BCS is such a big organisation and it can it can make such a big difference um, and make it all a bit more visible. A uh, fascinating uh, um, thing that I love to share is an example. Um, one of our members, uh, um, she's a trans woman and pushed her university to have uh, a better um, um, medical leave uh, um, structure in place um, with the idea that some trans people um, will uh, undergo uh, gender uh, confirmation surgery. And so given that they had good um, parental leave uh, that uh, would allow them to come back to work and have more research time, less teaching time, but oh, could we do something like that, uh, but for a medical leave? And lo and behold, something that has been a uh, champion and pushed forward by trans people is now mostly used by uh, CSAT people because everyone, might be in need of a medical leave. Yes, you're from, exactly right. <laughs> from as simple as breaking a limb to something that could be much more concerning, um, you suddenly there is a structure written by HR to support somebody coming back from work. And was clearly a barrier, it was clearly a barrier forever. Anyone who went to an extended medical uh, problem and think now with uh, uh, weeks of COVID and low COVID, uh, everyone that went to un went anything medically related had no support before. 
because nobody had the foretold of thinking, oh, we have something that is um, structured already to support people that take uh, uh, a medium long break. Uh, why don't we just uh, keep it going when we have for everything? But you see, once you take, once a minority shows, uh, recognize a barrier and show that there are ways to take down the barriers, then everyone benefits because the barriers are just affect everyone. It's just that if you have the privilege, you can sort of sidestep them. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Uh, you, you're hundred percent right. You know, it, it, it's one of those things that will help everyone out. It's not just the minority. It helps everyone. Um, Okay, I, I do have another question. I realize that I'm hogging the time, but we have any, um, but I'm just waiting for some more questions to come through. Um, but I guess this is probably gonna be a loaded question, but what would be your proudest moment um, that you'd achieved, whether that's within the Pride in STEM charity, whether that's uh, with your work as a journalist, like mm -hmm. what, what would be your, your sort of proudest achievement? Um, okay, um, work as, uh, as a journalist, I think it was uh, covering uh, the first, uh, um, the first um, image of a supermassive black hole back in 2019. Uh, I would say the proudest moment simply because uh, um, they didn't want to share any information before uh, the event. And I was on I was on the tarmac of on a plane waiting to go to San Francisco for a conference, and I wrote that article quickly. But I, I, I was so obsessed with that uh, um, observation campaign that I started writing about it in 2017. So when they finally had the um, the results, I was like, "That is my story. I need to write it." So, and I did, and uh, I think that is will always say, uh, remain my favorite. Uh, um, story mostly because after I finished writing and we were like luckily del delayed of 30 minutes I um, a person my copy editors are working on it and at that point I was just listening to the conference because I was needing to write uh, and so I wasn't seeing the picture so I sent the article I saw the picture and I know a lot of people describe it always blurry and fuzzy but for me it was the most beautiful thing that i have ever seen and i started crying and the two women next to me are like what the hell this guy literally was typing like crazy and then it just went like to start sobbing and then so i had to explain why it was so important that they had to get a telescope the size of the earth uh, by connecting all this different radio telescope and it was an incredible achievement it's um, the quality of the image is like seeing uh, a donut uh, on the surface of the moon with your naked eye. This wow. is uh, how precise it is. Uh, so yes, uh, that uh, I think probably that was my proudest moment. When it comes to um, when it comes to Brandon STEM is uh, going to be LGBTQ STEM Day, and I would say last year's uh, simply because not only we were treated by museums uh, and big institutions. Uh, the White House, uh, um, the um, astronauts, uh, it just felt that uh, there was so much community engagement. What I wanted when we first thought of the idea of this date is not to be something that is uh, pushed by us uh, eventually, that eventually is just going to be something that happens, uh, that people don't uh, have to sign up or do anything. It's just something that is there. That that's fantastic. I mean, I'm looking forward to the LGBT STEM Day as well. I, I've got already got that in my calendar. Excellent. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll have something happening. Uh, we are in discussion for something happening physically and virtually. Oh, that will be that will be great. I, I'm loving that that we can start doing physical events again, um, and having that hybrid of physical and virtual is, is fantastic. I think uh, for us. Uh, uh, we want to go back to do more um, physical stuff, but I think it's important uh, um, having the hybrid because uh, you want to make them as accessible as possible for everyone. And not everyone is still comfortable, can uh, be out uh, as the pandemic uh, 
pretty much continues to go, even though a government pretends like, oh, everything is fine. Yep. <laughs> You're exactly right. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there is a little bit of putting heads in the sand there. Um, but yeah, it, yeah, I am all for a, a hybrid model as someone with a chronic illness as well. I, I think that works perfectly because it, it still keeps it open, keeps it available. Um, and it's absolutely great. Um, right, so it looks like we haven't had any questions through. Um, so you've just had to answer loads of questions from me. Um, so before we finish up for today, have you got any last closing words? Oh, wasn't ready for that. that. So, um, <laughs> I would say I, at the moment, uh, uh, because actually we ask you not to turn on your cameras, uh, uh, you are mostly just a list of names. So I don't know if you are uh students uh, if you are early career so i know but where you are know that uh, there is uh, a lot of people that want to make uh, this world uh, better if you feel that uh, uh you are struggling uh, um and who doesn't this day like we look around at so much injustice and uh, so many things that we wish to change. I would say that uh, there are so many people that are working so hard to make things uh, better and uh, goes from major changes to tiny changes. And I think something that uh, made me, makes me feel very blessed uh, for this time is that I got to meet so many people and so many people are so humble that are doing amazing things. I'm like, oh, but I don't know, I'm just helping five people here or there. And I'm just like, you can help one person and you are doing amazing. So if you feel a bit demoralized, know that there are a lot of people that are trying to make the world better. And if you, if you are like me and feel absolutely enraged by everything that I told you, there's always more things that we can do. And so put that uh, rage to good use uh, and uh, I don't, know, don't reply to hate mail. Uh, that has been my greatest lesson, the greatest lesson that I learned uh, in work. Uh, and instead uh, uh, use that uh, fire to do something good uh, when you can. That's fantastic. Um, I, I may end up pinching that quote and sharing the <laughs> when we share the recording of this if that's all that, right. that is absolutely fine i literally i was like i'm not really prepared so i'm just going to mash a little bit of my philosophy together so yeah no that that was absolutely fantastic um so um i just want to say a big thank you to you uh dr carpanetti it has been a massive a, a massive privilege to talk to you today um, thank you so much for having me no worries no worries at all um and to all of our attendees if you are interested in joining bcs uh you can head over to our membership page uh so if you just google bcs membership it will be probably the first thing that pops up and with the code bcs pride uh which you can see in my background behind me uh you actually get 20 percent off your membership as well um if you are a student, I understand that you're probably being bombarded with professional memberships all the time. But from a personal standpoint, I can highly recommend BCS. Uh, BCS offers mentoring. Uh, they offer innumerable uh, networking opportunities, um, lots of training, job help. Um, there, is, there is loads available within BCS. Uh, so I 100% recommend it if you're thinking about it. Um, and so we look forward to also having you part of the BCS Pride group if you do join us. Uh, I'd love to see you there as well. Um, so yeah, fabulous. Thank you so much. And um, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your lovely sunny day um, and have a lovely sunny afternoon. Thank you.